So hello everyone. Um, today I'm here with Professor Dr. Rima Alaifari. Alaifari. With Rima Alaifari. She is the youngest professor at Eteha, associate professor? Assistant. Assistant professor at Eteha in mathematics. Um, so is your work research more in pure math or yeah. is it, so can you explain sort of what your lab works on? Okay. So uh, yeah, I'm in the field of applied mathematics. Okay. And that means that we do different things uh, in inverse problems, signal processing, and now we just, you know, start a bit on deep learning also. Okay, cool. And so can, to someone that doesn't know, for me, for example, I don't really know what deep learning is. Can you ex expand on that a little bit? Maybe. Sure. So uh, deep learning is um, a machine learning type of, uh, well, algorithms in okay. general. And um, what, what you do in deep learning is you have a task that you'd like the machine to learn. So you give it a training set. Mm -hmm where it can learn basically um, what the task is. For example, recognizing objects and images, you give it a lot of images and you tell it what's on the image. So it learns images of cats and it learns images of dogs, for example, and so on. And then after this training phase, it will be able to, to actually recognize in other images that it hasn't seen before what objects will be in there. Okay, so that sounds a lot like, um, like do you have a lot of crossover with computer science then? With, with this project, um, it's very, um, how do you say, uh, coding heavy. Okay. Um, but that's not true for the other projects. So the other projects are more of theoretical um, nature where we try to find, um, you know, theoretical results like uh, mainly stability results. So you have a problem from industry, for example, and you'd like to prove um, for a certain operation that it is... Um, stable under measurement noise. That means if you slightly corrupt your data, mm -hmm. the, the output will not completely change. And okay. in many problems, it does change completely. So you need to do more to get these stabilized. Okay. And um, what are the sort of like direct applications for this work? Like, is there anything, is this sort of, um, like I know machine learning has a lot of direct applications, sure. but like in, in terms of what you're working with, like are you guys applying it directly to any any sort of work right now? Um, yeah, so when it when it comes to, to the, um, I mean, when you think about inverse problems, which is my major background, um, there you have different applications. So my PhD, for example, was on medical imaging. Okay. So there you had an application, but I took it from a theoretical perspective and tried to, show what we actually can expect from these um, type of algorithms. Okay. Um, so, you know, it's always an application, but really taking it to the um, theoretical side. And then for the steep learning, which is rather recent, it's, it's really more applied. We want to see, so we, we test on these existing algorithms and see whether we can fool the system. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. By, constructing these examples, these okay. adversarial examples. Okay, and so later her talk will probably be posted on the TEDx, um, TEDx YouTube channel, which when it comes out, I'll link it below, but your talk was about crushing labels. And in the beginning, you were speaking about um, you, at 14, you decided you wanted to be a mathematician. So I'm assuming a lot of people don't actually have these, uh, maybe a lot of mathematicians do. I, don't, I never decided out of nowhere that I was gonna be an engineer. So was it really this sort of um, epiphany that you had or how did you really, is there sort of a deeper mm -hmm. um, realization mm -hmm. when you had uh, that you wanted to be a mathematician? Well, actually, when it came to subjects at school, I liked, you know, really many, many different subjects. I liked languages, I liked physics, I liked mathematics. Um, and, you know, I always felt that with mathematics, I could also reach out to the other subjects like yeah. engineering or physics, yeah. um, these things. Whereas if I was a physicist, I would, you know, really be doing this and maybe it would be harder to reach out to other fields. And now with, especially as an applied mathematician, what you can do is you can you know, try to look at different applications from mm -hmm. different fields, mm -hmm. and this is really what is exciting. And I think for my um, decision, of course it helped. I mean, I, I really had a lot of support from my parents. Yeah. They were both electrical engineers by training. Okay. So it kind of came naturally to, you know, go into academia. Yeah. Um, but, for example, I never wanted to become an electrical engineer because I felt I will be doing this much. Yeah, life. yeah. And as a mathematician, I just have more... It was really this art of proving, which is, I, I think, just very beautiful. Yeah. Um, so I, I think what, what also helped is, 
um, you know, I took some extra I mean, extra courses mm -hmm. in um, more f fun mathematics, uh, these Olympiads and so on. Mm -hmm. And there, you know, when you're exposed to proving something at the age of 14, it really is fun because it's so different from the math that we learn at school, which is more like just calculating things, yeah. right? And calculating things can actually be quite boring. Whereas, you know, thinking about a problem and trying to come up with a proof is actually quite exciting. Mm -hmm. I think that's really exciting for people to see that mathematics is like the proofs are beautiful and you know when I was in high school like yeah I remember doing just tons of math proofs but that mathematics is also there's a huge uh, there's a, an applied side of mathematics mm -hmm. and I think a lot of kids or high school students don't really see that when they're in high school um, and so it's really it's mm -hmm. really refreshing to speak to someone about about these uh, about new topics this mm -hmm. is what I like when I do these interviews I think you know what how I see mathematics is it's it's actually a creative job yeah and, and this is the main point so it's like it's a bit of art right we are being creative we have these new problems especially when they come from applications that we have no idea how to deal with right mm -hmm. and then you really have to become creative and kind of it's it's a bit of an artistic thing yeah. that you're doing so um this is this is really you know what makes this subject always new and refreshing and you know you're not doing all the you know, same thing all over all the time but it's really so different from time from every problem is so different from the other problem and even as a professor do you find that um even though you're working in a specific field doing a specific job do you find that you still get those refreshing new creative problems that you have to solve definitely definitely yeah. all the time i mean it's never that you sit down and think oh this problem is easy i know how to solve it right it's mm -hmm. always some, some problem where you think, oh my gosh. <laughs> so, if you like being creative, you should go into academia and be an applied professor <laughs> in mathematics. <laughs> we have this talk about, I don't know if you saw the Globe uh, Eteha yes. cover. Yeah, um, and I actually saw you inside I was the, inside. Yeah. <laughs> and um, there was a lot of talk about how um, other schools like in ETH, you have to accept everyone that applies that passes the Matura. And ETH doesn't have this like this option to um, like pick students mm -hmm. like schools in the US or in Canada, for example, or in other countries. Um, and people always people always telling me about this uh, positive bias and how positive bias isn't good. And you know what I mean about positive bias, but you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, we, in German we call it positive discrimination. Positive so. discrimination. So what are your thoughts on positive discrimination? Do you think it's prevalent in our society or do you think it's necessary or do you think there are other ways to include women in STEM fields? Yeah, that's a hard question. I think, I mean, you sh I think it's, it may be important and necessary. You mm -hmm. shouldn't, you know, bend this too much, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you shouldn't have people you know, maybe taking positions just because they're women and you have to fill the position somehow. Yeah. Um, but I do feel that there is the necessity to do more than just to say, you know, as it is usually in applications where it says women are encouraged to apply. Yeah. And then, you know, in the, um, in the selection committee, you maybe have one woman out of 14 or so. Um, so I, I think, uh, yes, for the moment, we actually need some quota. Yeah. Right. Um, but uh, I also see that it's hard to get a balance in terms of, you know, really, it, it should be right, it should be about your qualification mainly. Mm -hmm. But then on the other hand, you really have to have, for example, a selection committee, an unbiased committee that yeah. doesn't mean that women aren't biased, mm -hmm. you know. And studies have shown that uh, women are not um, actually protected from this bias, so they're yeah. also biased against women, so it doesn't mean that you know, if an, on a committee of 50% women, then everything's fine. Uh, I think there is just more that you need to do. Yeah, no, and I completely agree. I, I think the quotas are, I like, I think they are necessary because then it sort of makes you think twice about these biases instead of just taking the first person that you think is qualified, think is qualified. even though studies have shown that women are seen as less qualified for having the same qualifications and have to work three times harder or something. Some, some number like that. Mm. Um, but wrapping up, because I know that you have to go. Um, so in your talk, you spoke about how like we need to eliminate labels. And for all of the open-minded people in this stadium, I think, you know, for us, we're like, 
we, we, I, I would like to think that I'm like a, a self-aware person and I can look about at, at my own actions. But then you said a story about like these people on the train, then how they were s s saying really nasty things to you. And so I just wanted to know for, for students that are not only trying to become engineers or mathematicians or anything in STEM, but then they on top of that have to worry about all of this other stuff. Mm -hmm. For example, if someone is, um, yeah, um, hating on them for their culture. Mm. I, I can't think of the right words, hating yeah. on them for their culture. Um, what, what advice would you give to them? Because clearly these people on the train were not trying to crush labels or mm. open doors. Yeah, I think, you know, if you have someone in front of you who is as determined as this person, for example, was, then it, there is no big point in, you know, talking to this person. But I think what is really, really important is that we start reporting these things when they happen. Okay. And there are, you know, some institutions like anti-discrimination institutions and so on that actually want to collect these cases and, and hear about these cases because if they're not reported, they didn't exist, right? Yeah. And there is nothing you can do about it. And also, you know, in politics, it will never be a discussion because they just don't exist. They, mm -hmm. they were never reported. And I, th I know it takes some courage. Actually, at that I mean, that night, the the train conductor he offered me that I, that he calls the police. Yeah. But you know, I it was it was a night, and I had my father waiting for me to pick me up, and I just felt you know, yeah, I, I don't want to report on it because you know the police will come, my father will maybe be very worried and upset yeah, and so yeah. on. So I, I didn't report on it, which I think was a mistake back then because now it didn't happen basically, and so that's that's really something. And you know, not only strangers. I mean, it could happen that. Maybe, you know, within the university, someone is, I mean, we have this respect campaign now at ETH, which I yeah, think yeah. is very, very important. And it is encouraging people to actually speak out when things happen, if it happens to themselves or maybe to their colleagues or so. Mm -hmm. That's very important. Mm -hmm. And last question. Sure. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Last question I wanted to know. Um, what is the, what advice, if you could give one advice to like young women that you know look up to you and that want to pursue the same path what would you tell them is the most important thing that they should you know think about or like the best advice that you can give these girls uh don't listen to other people okay <laughs> i mean don't listen to people who tell you that you can't or that you have to choose between family or academia or your career, um, or that, you know, having kids will be so overwhelming. I mean, it is difficult, but, you know, just break out of these roles that we're so used to, right? Mm -hmm. And just, um, yeah, just choose for yourself what you want to do, and then you will always have people who think that you can't do it. And, yeah, you know, that's their problem. It shouldn't be your problem that, that they think you can't do it. Yeah. And I, I know that's hard to just, you know, shut off all this noise that you get from the outside, but really just think, I can do this. And I think the other thing is to get connected. So look for other people, other women that you know are studying mm -hmm. these sciences or, you know, are maybe postdocs or professors or whatever. Really, it, it really helps to talk to, it helped me, for example, to talk to people who are more senior than I was. Mm -hmm. it's like, oh, you have kids. Oh, it actually works. Oh, you're a woman, right? I mean, these, these things help immensely. I think we have to get more connected. Yeah, so get more connected and have faith in yourself, pretty Definitely. much. Okay. And shut off the noise. From yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. For, for this talk. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks uh, for watching.